Fort Worth, Texas, the heart of cowboy country. Next to the old stockyards is Exchange Street, where they still drive cattle for the tourists. It's a reminder of perhaps the most evocative journeys ever taken through the American West. The journeys of the cowboys driving the Longhorns to markets in the north. Frank Milano explains how the cattle drives began. In 1865, after the Civil War was over in America, Texas had fought on the Confederate side, which was the losing side. When the Confederate soldiers got back home from the war, Confederate money had no value. There was no gold or silver to back it up. So the state of Texas was basically broke. But up north, around Chicago, New York, and Boston, they had machinery, they were prosperous, they were doing well, they had won the Civil War, and they had money. But they didn't have one thing, and that was meat. You know, Some of those Confederate soldiers got the idea why don't we do a trade-off? We give you our cattle, you give us your money. It would take about 10 to 12 uh, drovers, they were called, trading cowboys, and they would take them about three to four months to drive the cattle from the state of Texas all the way to the state of Kansas. And the reason for that was, that's where the railroad lines were in America at the time. They were running east and west, and so they would take the cattle down there they would sell the cattle down there in those places for 30 to $35 a head. Here in Texas, at the very same time, the value of those animals was a dollar to $2 a head. One cowboy who experienced the heyday of the great cattle drives was a certain Teddy Blue Abbott. As a young man, he'd run away from home, escaping the drudgery of a Nebraska farm for the romance of the open trail. I never got on with my father. I never pretended to. He'd tell me to coat up, coat up, and go out and feed the cattle in below zero weather while the rest of the family sat around the stove. In summer, the cattle were out on the range, and I was out with him, living in camp and cooking my own grub just like a man. And that was how I got so friendly with the Texas cow punchers. And my father expected to make a farmer of me after that. It couldn't be done. One night he said, you take Kit and Charlie tomorrow and plow the West Ridge. Like hell I plow the West Ridge. And when he woke the next morning, I was gone. Teddy Blue made his way south to Texas and he signed up with Print Olive, a notoriously tough trail boss. And in the spring of 1879, his first trail drive north began, out through the Texas heat into the wilds of Oklahoma. All the cattle in the world seemed to be coming up out of Texas. On the trail, you were rarely out of sight of a herd. You could see the dust for 20 miles it was such a pretty sight to see them all strung out, sun flashing on their horns. The average crew was 11 men. Two men in the lead were the point men, and the two behind them on swing, two on the flank and two on drag in the rear. With the cook and the horse wrangler and the boss, that made 11. Poorest man always worked on drag. I've seen him come off a herd with dust half an inch deep on their hats and thick as fur in their eyebrows and mustaches. And if they shook their head, dust would fall off them in showers. The life of the cowboy was not a very glamorous life. It wasn't a John Wayne type of a life. The cowboy is gonna have to be away from his family, from his home, from his loved ones for about three to four months. Not only that, he's gonna be on top of a horse from the time the sun goes up in the morning till the time the sun goes down. And if you've ever been out here in Texas and seen some of these 100 degree weather days, you know what I'm talking about. The sweat will come out from you of places you never even knew you had. This is Abilene, Kansas, 
the journey's end. In its heyday, 600,000 cattle a year were herded into Abilene to be loaded onto rail trucks and shipped to market back east. Once, this place was alive with the sounds of cowboys fresh off the trail, drinking hard, playing hard. But that way of life was to pass with surprising speed. Because the railroad that took the Longhorns east was bringing settlers back west. And the landscape of America was changing. What once had been open land was now enclosed, impassable to cattle. And the cowboys watched in resentment. Those jayhawkers would plant a crop alongside the trail. And then when the cattle got into their wheat, they'd come out cussing or waving a shotgun and yelling for damages. Or they'd take up a claim by the rivers and creeks and charge us for water. Never mind the cattle have been coming through there when they were still raising pumpkins in Illinois. The cowboys, like the Indians, needed space to survive. But the days of the open range were over. And so in 1883, in one last drive, Teddy Blue herded Longhorns up through Nebraska, north and west, to the one last belt of unsettled pasture on the Great Plains, Montana, big sky country. And here a new breed of cowboy emerged, no longer drovers, but ranchers, working their cattle on vast tracts of land they themselves enclosed. Teddy Blue built a ranch and raised a family, and he watched as civilization caught up with him. When I came, it was virgin country still, with long grass for the cattle, and hostile engines are only neighbors. But within a few years, it was all transformed. There was a town at Fort McGinnis and another at Maiden, and the railroad went right through Montana. Fences and sheep and settlers were coming in, and the old time big cow outfits were going out. And nothing was like it used to be anymore.